It was 22 centuries ago. China had been at war for 500 years. It seemed as if it would never end. When they weren't fighting each other, the warrior kings of the seven states were busy with the chaos and corruption inside their own borders. No one was safe. To the west, in the capital city of Shenyang, revolution was in the air. The politicians were playing a dangerous game. The prime minister was leading a conspiracy against the new king. <laughs> he had announced his challenge by putting up posters on the city gates demanding the king change his policies. It was a big mistake. The prime minister had seriously underestimated the young king, for this was the man who was destined to become the prince of heaven, the man who would change his world forever. This was the mighty Chin. The rebellion was crushed, the leaders taken alive, but not for long. Jin's response to the palace revolt would be quick and public, something everyone would understand. Prime Minister, after being forced to watch the execution, was offered an easier way out. There was now no doubt who was ruling the kingdom of Qin. With the rebellion crushed at home, Qin's army could now concentrate on taking over the other kingdom. The army was the one way to escape the drudgery of the farm. If a young man fought well and survived, he would be rewarded. It was a temptation few could resist. (laughs) 
，小妹，二老就托给你了。哥，你就放心的走吧。凯儿，凯儿。By the thousands, farm boys would be drawn to dreams of glory, drawn to the army. And there was none mightier than the army of Chin. Chin's generals knew the value of a well-trained army. Many of them had spent their entire lives learning the arts of war. They were more than princes on horseback. They were professional soldiers. They had taken untrained peasants and farm boys and turned them into the greatest fighting force the world had ever known. We want to meet the king. What are you doing? 老爷，我们要投军。哦，你们会干什么？拿弓来。In a time before gunpowder, a regiment of archers was a powerful weapon. It would take ten more years of war, but Chin was relentless. He conquered Han, Wei, and Chao. After a long campaign, he finally crushed the kingdom of Chu. But in the land of Yan, they had a plan. A plan which even today the school children of China can recite by heart. It was to be a last desperate attempt to stop Qin from winning it all. It would take one brave man, a man named Jin Ku, a man destined for death. His job was to get close enough to Qin to assassinate him. Whether he was successful or not, for Jin Ku, 
It would mean, of course, certain death. He brought with him a special gift and a scroll pledging allegiance. The gift, for Qin's amusement, was the head of a treacherous general. The scroll was to contain an even bigger surprise. Even in the face of death, no one was allowed on the king's dais without permission. Chin, enraged, sent his vast army into Yen. After five centuries of war, five centuries of death, Qin would have his empire. But oh, the cost. Oh, the cost. For the archer who had fought so bravely, a promotion. They made him an officer. <laughs> to record his greatness for all time, Qin declared himself Qin Shi Huang, first emperor of China. The new empire, said Qin, would last 10,000 generations. He believed he was the most powerful ruler the world had ever known, for he was convinced no civilized world existed outside his empire.
the most beautiful women of China were brought to his court. His favorite, he made empress. There had never been a coronation like it. The archer, now a captain of the palace guard, knew that even the handmaidens of the palace were the personal property of the mighty emperor. Chin's control was total. He owned everything. He owned everybody. As part of the coronation, Qin declared an end to war. He had the bronze weapons taken from his enemies and from the peasants. He melted them down to make 12 huge statues proclaiming peace for all time. In a country which had lived with wars for over 500 years, it was time for celebration. Qin knew it would take more to create an empire than just defeating the other kingdoms. He moved now to unite them with a series of reforms. To emphasize their importance, he would stamp these new laws with the rarely used royal seal. This emphasized that these were no ordinary edicts, these were decrees from heaven.
Each of the different kingdoms had used their own system for weights and measures. Chin's decrees now introduced a universal standard and sent inspectors into the markets to make sure they were being used. To speed up transportation, he had the roads widened so that six horses could pass at the same time. He built new irrigation systems. He issued new coins which could be used anywhere in the empire. He even stopped the confusion of the various written languages by introducing simplified characters. From now on, this would be the new word for horse. For the first time in centuries, the country was learning to live with peace. The archer had found a wife. A serving girl at the palace became a gift from his emperor. But it was all too good to last. Chin had insisted that his law be the only law. But there were books throughout the empire which promoted freedom of thought. Chin had a solution for that. He burned the books. The burning of the books enraged the intellectuals of the day. Chin also had a solution for them. He buried 460 of them alive. Criticism stopped. The various kingdoms had built a series of walls for defense. Chin now ordered that the northern walls should be connected into one great wall to keep the Mongol raiders out. Meng Tian Da Jiangjun. Chen Zai. I'll give you 50 men. 加上你二十万士兵his general and his eldest son were sent to supervise construction. This would be the foundation of the Great Wall of China. 5,000 kilometers long, it would employ 700,000 people, just a portion of Qin's mighty legacy. And there would be more. It was the custom for all kings to have elaborate burial sites. A 
and for the first emperor, it would have to be a grave unlike any other. He was planning a huge palace tomb inside a man-made mountain and stretching out before it, underground, a life-sized replica of his royal guard. Huge terracotta factories were put to work building the clay army, an army which would be joining their emperor on his journey to glory. To make the journey easier, they would bring bronze works of art and weapons. They would bring jewels and gifts. The tomb and the army would remind the gods that they were now dealing with the first emperor of China. In all, it would take 36 years to build, countless slaves working, so Chin could live comfortably forever in heaven. Soon, even that would not be enough. Chin decided that he wanted to live forever on Earth. After all, if anyone could be immortal, why shouldn't it be the most important man the world had ever seen? He became obsessed with immortality. He commissioned his alchemists to create a formula which would allow him to do battle with death, his only remaining enemy. They made him special pills containing mercury. These would eventually kill him. Chin was now 50 years old. His 270 palaces were filled with riches. He had 3,000 concubines. He had been in complete control for 10 years, but it was not enough. He had still not conquered death. If there was a recipe for immortality, perhaps he would find it somewhere in his vast empire. Somewhere out there, he would find the secret of everlasting life. But even for the first emperor, that was not to be.
一下。陛下，陛下，陛下Chin had 24 sons, but it was the 18th, Hu Hai, who forged a new will and proclaimed himself emperor. Whoever controlled the royal seal controlled the decrees from heaven. Chin's original will had named the oldest son heir, but it would come to nothing. The forged will ordered the eldest son to commit suicide. Such was the power of Chin that he did so immediately and without question. The wars would soon start all over again. Chin had unified China, but his dynasty which was to have lasted for 10,000 generations, would crumble within 36 months of his death. As the centuries passed, Chin's might faded into history. The man-made mountain which served as his tomb became overgrown. Other emperors, other tombs, would soon dot the landscape of China. The secrets of Qin's great burial site were lost in myth, in legend, and in dust. It took 22 centuries for those secrets to finally emerge from that dust. In 1974, some farmers, digging a new well in the shadow of a strange hill, collided with history. For at the bottom of that simple well stood the army of the mighty Qin, still leading their emperor into eternity. pit alone there are 7,000 terracotta chariots, horses, foot soldiers, and archers. Chin's tomb has remained unopened, but the pits at the bottom of that well have brought a regiment of historians, restorers, and archivists who will now spend many new lifetimes with the army of the emperor. This is Jiang Jingyong. Oh, you are so high. Yes. They are still 
，你们工作量很大呀、啊。是啊，等全部修复，它将震动全世界。Although he died all those lifetimes ago, this archer is now strangely connected to the artist who draws him. They have a lot in common. Both of them, down through the centuries, are somehow still in the service of that mighty emperor, united here so that the Prince of Heaven may live forever. Perhaps his empire has lasted for 10,000 generations after all. That would not be a surprise to Qin, the first emperor.